Uh, without further ado, our speakers today are Candace Schumann and Rock Stevens, who are grad students in the University of Maryland College Park. So guys, take it away. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, sincerely, I want to thank everyone for coming out to the last talk of the day. Uh, it means a lot. I know there's a lot of uh, drinking between now and the pool party and dinner and whatnot. So I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so the bottom line up front, you know, what we hope you all can take away is everyone in the audience right now can use the skills, knowledge, and expertise that you, ha you currently have to make an impact on the world. Uh, in the news, uh, you see lots of things about bug bounty programs, uh, you know, all the new zero days that are coming out, uh, you know, getting a million dollars for the latest uh, iOS exploit. But at the end of the day, uh, as a security practitioner, what if you can use your skills to save someone's life? And you know, this, we're going to give uh, some novel examples of you know, how you can use your skills right now, but you know, keep that in the back of your mind, and you know, maybe some, something you learn can inspire you to uh, carry on and uh, make a difference later on. So, All right, so um, please ask questions at any point, because I know biology can be a little scary. Um, but anyways, so what exactly is computational biology? Well, it all started when um, people started sequencing the genome, right? I'm sure some of you have heard about the Human Genome Project. And at first, you know, it took quite a long time to sequence a single genome. And now you can do it um, in the span of maybe one or two days or a week. And that means that we can sequence a lot of different things, like not just humans or animals, but bacteria and plants. And there's thousands and thousands of genomes out there that have been sequenced and that we want to do analysis on. And, you know, it's all well and good to do um, lab testing uh, in a wet lab with biologists, but that costs money um, and takes a lot of time, whereas computers, they're relatively cheap and they're pretty fast. So running biology experiments in silico or on computers um, really, really helps out the biologists. Um, so an example would be uh, some researchers uh, were looking at corn, and there was an invasive species that came into corn crops um, and started killing out all of the corn. And this was a major problem because corn is a big source of food. So what they wanted to do was kill out the invasive species while still having the corn available and not kill the corn, right? So they did this using systems biology. Um, and basically what systems biology does is it looks at the metabolism. So again, when I said that you started sequencing a genome, so you have a genome and that translates into genes and then you also have transcriptomics, which is the expression levels of genes. So that basically means like if you have blue eyes, you have that gene highly expressed. In metabolism, the genes that we're looking at are genes that transcribe proteins, which means they do physical chemical reactions inside of your cell. Um, and those reactions turn into metabolism, which, is, which creates various pathways, right? They're kind of like logic gates. And um, an extra added thing onto the logic gates is you have rate of flow, right? Rate of flow of a uh, protein, right? Of a reaction. Um, so what these people did was they took the metabolic path or metabolic network of corn and the metabolic network of the invasive species and they tried to knock down genes, so lower the gene expression of various genes to see what would kill the um, pl the plant, uh, the invasive species, and not kill the corn. So they basically created a genetically modified corn um, that was able to withstand the crop killer. Uh, and that's why we still eat corn today. So. Yeah. For some of it, yeah. yeah. So with that example, you know, that's hacking at a molecular level, right? You're exploiting something, changing the way it is, adapting its structure so that you can achieve an outcome. That's hacking. So uh, what we're talking about are some examples of things that you may have in your daily lives 
that uh, sort of correlate to the uh, research that we did together. So this uh, beautiful GIF right here uh, comes from the National Institute of Health. And what you're looking at are the number of databases that are publicly available with computational biology information. There's hundreds. Uh, some of these are federally funded programs. Uh, they're freely available. And some of them are you know, graduate students, postdocs, uh, other researchers that just made the data publicly available. For a lot of these instances, the data is just publicly available and unmaintained. And we'll come back to why this is an issue later. But it, for us, the immediate concern was, uh, let's say I have a pet name for something. If you don't know me very well, you probably don't know why I reference this pet name frequently. And you might have a different pet name for your dog. It's vastly different. Um, but when we start talking about our dogs together, I have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what I'm talking about. And this leads to disparate data sets, where a lot of these data sets are talking about the exact same thing, but use uncommon uh, terminology, so that when you start to aggregate all of this raw data available, there's no bridge between them. So. For many of you that have ever dealt, ever dealt with uh, intrusion response, uh, intrusion detection analysis, uh, this is a common problem for you, right? You know, you're looking at a piece of malware that's on a host. You want to know, you know all of the hard disk uh, forensics information. You want to port that to a centralized repository for analysis. But then you want to start pulling the over the wire data. What happened on the server logs? How did this uh, intrusion enter the network? And you'll know, start building a you know, larger picture of you know, adversaries, techniques, tactics, procedures for you know, what happened within your damn network. We want to do the exact same thing, except looking at a disease, looking at a, a pathogen, something that we want to target. So uh, with that, we want to all this freely uh, available data you can now ingest using these sort of hacker methodologies to make something that's easily queryable. Uh, if you're familiar with ELK, the uh, Elastic, uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, it just makes large data sets easily queryable. And that's exciting for us because the old way that we had to do it was actually building our own custom web scrapers. A lot of these databases, you know, you just have an XML file of uh, semi-structured data or the actual entire database file that you can uh, ingest. But a lot of them, just a website. And so if there's data that we needed off this particular website. We're having to build a manual crawler for every single website to pull what we need. Uh, using a methodology like this saved us a lot of time. So uh, if any of you have Bash scripting experience, Python scripting experience, uh, very similar when you want to actually go in and hack a cell. So uh, what we're going to do is do a real quick hands-on look at what I'm talking about. But before then, uh, what we're going to do in this little hands-on is uh, trimethoprim. It's an antibiotic drug that's used to treat uh, UTIs, urinary tract infections, that's caused by E. coli. So we have a drug, trimethoprim, a pathogen, E. coli, and we're, because we know this antibiotic kills E. coli, in computational biology, we expect it to say, yes, this thing is now dead when you treat the cell with a drug. That's what we're going to do right now. So literally, this is all it is. Um, in Python, we're leveraging a uh, system, a Cobra Pi, that's based off of Open Cobra. It's a uh, suite of machine learning and uh, computational biology tools that's available from the University of California, San Diego. And uh, importing that, it's two lines of code. And then the third line you'll see on here is us actually loading the metabolic model into memory. If you remember the extremely ugly diagram uh, Candace talked to you about earlier on, uh, a lot of things going on with uh, the metabolic network, this file is all of that represented in digitized format. All of the reactions, all the logic gates, every gene, uh, how they interact with one another is represented here in this file. So we have two drugs, trimethoprim and halothane. We know that trimethoprim should kill the model. And uh, halothane, not really sure what's going to happen to that, just another drug. So um, with, when you have a cell and you're focusing on its uh, metabolic network, inherently, as, as 
all cells want to thrive and reproduce. Spread the seed, re be productive, be fruitful. Um, and in this particular instance, we're assuming that all cells want to have optimal biomass growth. They want to achieve the, the largest spread of that seed. So what, we are, what we're doing in this metabolic network is targeting the biomass growth and want to find what drugs kill it, effectively denial of servicing the cell. So we're going to run a real quick script and see how when we apply two different drugs uh, using uh, knockdowns, uh, which are adding additional constraints to the model, saying that you know, given these targets uh, for like trimethoprim, we have two different targets, B2827 and B0048. Uh, in the absence of these genes being expressed within the model, what happens? So uh, according to the results, uh, trimethoprim results in zero biomass growth, which means it's dead. Um, but halothane has, a, it takes it from uh, the original level of 0.73 down to 0.138. Um, when you have drugs that don't completely kill a pathogen, it's important to note that you're actually breeding superbugs at this point because you're killing the weak ones and the strong ones survive and they breed. So the ones that are laughing at your drug, essentially, are the ones that are now the superbugs that you cannot treat with the same drug again. So uh, that will come into play later on in our research that we talk about. So um, that's how you use some of the, the methodologies that you may use in the common day workplace uh, for computational biology purposes. But there's also a surprising lack of knowledge that you guys take for granted that just do not exist in the world of computational biology. For example, this is a, scrape, a screenshot of a website. Um, this particular website allows you to query various uh, data in the underlying database, but does not sanitize or tokenize the input. So uh, this was a website that's a bit older. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming has never been audited for security. And why would something like this matter? I mean, it's not like a high value production system, it's just freely available data, right? Well, so a lot of this data is being used as the foundation of a lot of research. So when you have you know, a couple grants going towards fundamental research and you're unsure as if you know, some adversary is hosting malware or is corrupting any of the files on there, you know, that's a problem moving forward, right? And just the fact that we actually found one website that allows you to run raw SQL queries through a form and let you do whatever it wanted, uh, whatever you wanted, uh, without any repercussions. That was a huge concern for me as a security practitioner doing biology research. So if any of you are curious about where to find uh, the Metabolic models for various uh, pathogen species, whatever, um, this is the website, uh, BIG. Uh, you can go in there and download uh, various things that you may be interested in. But you'll also note that there's something missing from uh, the options that you can download things from. Uh, there's no integrity check. There's no checksum there. So uh, there's nothing to verify that this thing hasn't been tainted, uh, hosted server side, or corrupted while downloading. So the foundation of your research has zero integrity coming off of the wire moving forward, which brings all of the research you produce into question because you can't validate the validity of the underlying data structures, which is a huge problem that people just aren't considering right now. So another problem um, is that a lot of biology stuff is uniquely identifiable, right? So my genome is uniquely identified from Rock's genome. But also, our genomes are pretty similar, right? You can just take out a little bit and it'll still be the human genome and you won't know who's who. Um, but some research right now is looking at the microbiome, which is all of the bacteria that lives inside of your gut or your mouth or wherever on your body, your skin. Um, this is extremely unique. So my microbiome is completely different from any of yours. And in the future, um, with this lead towards precision medi medicine, um, you're going to have your genome and your microbiome on file at your doctor's office. And if anyone were to get a hold of this, that is completely uniquely identifiable. You can tell exactly 
who you're looking at. Yeah. So. so, and as of right now, a lot of this data is not being taken uh, you know, as sensitive because there aren't you know, ways to weaponize, exploit this sort of data presently. But because people aren't looking forward at the privacy and security considerations of this data resting unencrypted on someone's hard drive, uh, that's a problem that we're trying to bring light on. So, yeah. yep. Um, our research looks at um, bacteria that have become resistant to drugs. So, super bugs, right? Um, just a PSA, this happens when you do not finish your course of antibiotics. So, if you don't finish your course of antibiotics, you are creating super bugs, which is bad for everyone. So, finish your course of antibiotics is what I'm saying. But, some people don't. And there are bacteria that have, been, have become resistant to a lot of antibiotics. So the, pretty much the solution to this would be to create new drugs, right? But this is really, really expensive and takes a really long time. You know, you have to go actually find the genes that, it that would kill it, which takes time. Then you have to test it in the lab. And then you have to go through and test it on animals, make sure it doesn't kill anything. And then finally you get to human testing and the FDA has to approve it and this just takes a really long time and is really expensive. And major drug companies just don't want to do this, right? Because the problem with antibiotics is that bacteria are eventually going to become resistant to it. So put, they put all of this money into it, it lasts for a little bit, it's not an expensive drug, so they don't get much money for it and then it stops working. Right? So dr big drug companies are not creating new drugs for antibiotics. So our solution is to look at current drugs. Right? There are hundreds of drugs out there that um, we know the side effects of and we know their toxicity levels. And they're available. Um, so what we wanted to do was to look at current drugs that target human genes and then find the orthologs in bacteria. So orthologs are basically um, genes that have the same function in two different species. And this happened at a speciation event when we're talking about evolution, right? Um, so basically, if, we, if it targets a gene in humans, it should target the same functioning gene in the bacteria. And what we can do is repurpose these drugs. So say if we have a drug for a cold or, you know, some sort of arthritis drug. And we say, oh, here, we can use this as a new antibiotic, right? That will take less time, less money. All right. So what we did was we uh, started pulling together a lot of those databases, those disparate data sets. And we started building bridges together, uh, trying to find any way to st uh, stitch these data sets together to make them work for us. So what we ended up with was an enormous list of existing and experimental drugs. And we have the, you know, the human genome, we have the genome of E. coli, and then we started building bridges towards understanding what drugs would work against E. coli for this particular example. And uh, what we ended up making was a fully modular uh, set of code that would target any pathogen. So tuberculosis, uh, uh, strep, uh, staph infections. Uh, any, any sort of model that you load into there with the similar data, you can now use our methodology to check what drugs would be viable against this target. So uh, the first thing that we did was we knew trimethoprim worked. And so we, we looked for that in our data set and we found it were cool. And we also came up with several v other viable candidates that would be used to treat uh, resistant uh, E. coli. But as you're going to start seeing a lot of these uh, results pop up, uh, they're targeting the same genes. Uh, B2827, you'll see, uh, is a common thread as what drugs are, commenting, are targeting what gene within E. coli. So uh, given that trimethoprim, this is one of its targets, and it's now resistant to this particular drug, targeting the same exact, uh, the same exact gene is madness, right? Because you're going to get the same exact effect. 
So what we wanted to do was we ended up coming up with a list of 12 candidate drugs that would be viable alternatives to uh, traditional antibiotics. But we also wanted to know, are there any other combinations of drugs that would work? And so essentially, we took the same exact list and started performing double knockdowns of their targets, uh, seeing what would actually work. Our research showed that uh, there are zero viable alternatives for uh, E. coli, given this uh, methodology of double drug knockdowns, eliminating this list. Um, there were some drugs that had a uh, dampening effect on the metabolic rate, which means, yes, and a viable alternative is going to create superbugs. And that's exactly what we didn't want. So um, this is our candidate list. And some of the things that these drugs were used for largely were treating cancer patients. Um, chemotherapy, uh, there are some other experimental drugs in there, uh, one for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, but if you think about this, if you have a particular disease, that uh, your body is resistant to, and it's now a matter of life and death, you're gonna be more willing to use you know, these chemotherapy style drugs to save the patient. And here's some life advice for you. Uh, whatever you're doing, uh, you wanna save that patient, right? Um, so uh, if you have a particular patient on the deathbed and you have something with known toxicity levels you know the side effects, you believe that you can save the patient with this alternative drug, despite how immunosuppressive it is, uh, the impact on the patient. If it can bring that person back to life, spoiler alert, um, it's probably uh, something that you're gonna wanna take. So moving forward, um, we've talked about a couple ways that you can use skill sets you have right now to help find alternative drugs uh, to resistant diseases. But at the end of the day, you need the, understand, the fundamental understanding of biology to make this sort of thing happen. One of these uh, candidate drugs is actually a disinfectant. So uh, the traditional way of inducing, uh, you know, treating internal uh, issues with a disinfectant is drinking a bottle of disinfectant, which in turn would probably kill the coli, right? And the patient, uh, breaking the previous life advice rule. So, um, while we were able to use our various methodologies and computational biology to find viable alternatives, some of them simply will not work because of the mode of uh, treatment. So uh, if any of you are interested in learning more about the fundamentals of biology, there are some ways that you can do that. Uh, if you're like me and you need structure in your life, uh, there are several extremely well-polished uh, free courses available. Uh, MIT OpenCourseWare has the fundamentals of computational biology. If any of you are familiar with uh, Coursera or EDX, they also have amazingly well-polished uh, products available for free that take you through an entire semester's course at your own pace. Um, if you like a little bit less structure and you like uh, CTFs or coding competitions, there's websites like Rosalind that will, uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, like Project Euler, uh, other websites like that that teach you uh, mathematics, this is another example like that, that uh, you need to solve computational biology problems. It's not gonna tell you how, you go out and find it, you build the scripts that do it, and uh, it's more of a hands-on approach to learning. So, um, in recap, uh, we've gone through some of the methodologies that I was able to use from my emphasis background to help our research in computational biology. And uh, like this, also thank the people that made this uh, trip possible for us. Uh, and we're also open to any questions that you might have right now about our research. Please. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the funding comes from the federal government, so there is a lot of uh, 
regulation that goes on. Um, as far as some mad scientist weaponizing it? No. Um, and with all the data freely available publicly, then you know, there's nothing to say that you couldn't come up with it on your own and right. do your own private tests. So, but, yeah. Also, you have to get a biologist to agree to do the actual experiments. So, because, you know, it's, it's all well and good to do things in silico, but it's not perfect. Uh, you, you still need the wet lab tests when you've narrowed down your search. Yeah, all of the metabolic models and uh, the data sets that we have, they're all imperfect. Uh, it's a representation of our best guess at what's going on uh, through, I mean, it's right, I mean, it's science, right? But it also is a best guess at what's going on at any particular moment, uh, given a reaction uh, going on. Please. Right, so that's the, the in silico process of, th that is being done. You know, um, it, uh, going through uh, with the metabolic model, you can enumerate every single gene, and you can perform single and double knockdown of these genes to find single or double pairs that result in lethality, mm -hmm. if you want to kill something. And uh, the synthetic lethality is a well-discovered, I mean, uh, well-researched uh, area. And uh, do, going that in reverse to find new, or to make new drugs, uh, that target that um, is being done. Mm -hmm. But as we mentioned earlier, it's a very lengthy process, very expensive process. And if you have something available that's already approved right now, our pitch is why not use it? Mm -hmm. So that's commercial development. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yep. yep. And then, you know, with big data or with uh, big pharma, it's always the return on investment at that particular point. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, for me, particularly, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've been doing infosec since I was like a little kid, so uh, it's something I'm passionate about. But uh, uh, we actually took a class together on uh, metabolic networks, and that's what sort of mm -hmm. uh, kicked this uh, research forward. Yep. So uh, we kind of combined our skills, I guess. For yeah, she she works in the computational biology lab full time, and uh, I'm a security researcher at Maryland. So yeah, it was it was fun working together, and uh, I think we have some things and uh, hopefully get a publication out of it as well mm -hmm. so yep. please um, in the past I've done some work with molecular biology and stuff like that so bring back here is this computational biology back into the old days when here was just a bunch of college <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I, my recommendation would be doing some of the, the fundamentals that we talked about with biology, uh, getting back into, I know you have extensive experience, but computational biology, uh, and even though the different libraries that are available to you are you know, brand new, largely. So uh, doing that, and then uh, for collaboration, uh, you know, like with U UCSD in Maryland, I mean, there are a lot of huge labs that are always looking for collaborative partners. Yep. Um, and you know, with all the freely available data, you know, if you set up your own experiments and you're like, hey, I think I might have this interesting finding, and sharing it, publish, publishing it, you know, you would have uh, other bio biological researchers be able to pick that up. Right, and I mean, there's a lot of papers that are coming out right now that combine these two fields. So I mean, even reading them and then saying, oh, you know, maybe I can change something like this. I don't know, that's a, there's tons of stuff out there. there I mean, it's like, it's really low hanging fruit that you can. So, the particular example of corn, uh, we know the individual that was asked to help with it, and he was offered several millions of dollars to help do that project. And he didn't because he wanted to pursue other things. 
but uh, that project went forward and now they have, you know, crop resistant corn or weed killer resistant corn, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, you can guess what kind of company would have invested in that. But uh, yeah, there's money to be had in it with, like she said, low hanging fruit. Yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, there's there's a, a big effort to create um, these communities uh, all over the place. So I, I know some people that are doing that right now um, or attempting to. So like there there are com community spaces that are being created for this kind of collaboration. Yeah. So. Um, if you want to contact us, we can try to find more precise answers for you other than saying, yes, it's being done. <laughs> cool. Uh, any other questions? Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.